math book, science book, if you're in science, you come to church, bring a Bible with you. I know a lot of you have it on your apps and stuff. I, did, I have one on my app. And uh, Last night I had a dream. My iPad crashed. My phone crashed. And I left my Bible. Don't leave your Bible. Amen. Have something to write in. Yesterday I was amazed at um, a young man that testified. We uh, had a man sh- share. His name was Wade. And he shared about drug abuse. He shared about how his life was caught up in it. It was generational because of his dad. He got into it. He was told not to do something, yet his dad did. Because of that, he fell into it, into his teens and early 20s. He admitted he shot a man in self-defense. He was later uh, released from all of that. Yeah, he killed a guy and uh, was running and kept falling back into the drugs. He had a son got married, and he did not want to, uh, his son to feel the shame that he had. He talked and he, he shared about relapsing, falling back. There's one thing that I absolutely understand is relapse, to fall off the wagon, to be addicted or to struggle, or even to be a believer in Christ and then act like Peter and deny him. When I'm walking through Scripture, and I, this is going to be a little different because I've played this out in my mind even while I'm, I, I dream I'm preaching. You know, it's just who I am. But I was thinking about the Jesus you know. Many of you, when you saw the movie last week, uh, uh, Jesus Revolution, you understood me. You understood how my heart is toward the misfits, how we gear the church toward reaching people that in this life I can't bring anything to heaven other than those that I've won to Christ to be an example, do the best you can. And even in the movie, it shared relapses. It did not hide it, pull away from it. And I appreciated that. But one of the issues that I see is that we live in such an electronic age that we email, we text. And I'm going to tell you, it's gotten me in a lot of trouble. Because there are times that I will email or text somebody, and those who receive those uh, electronic miscues, they cannot hear the tone in my voice. They can't see the wink in my eye or the lift of my head, you know, that I'm, I'm just jacking with them. And I do a lot of jacking with people. I had a pastor get hold of me about a situation, and I said, um, Actually, an invitation to come and be a part of our church. And, and I, I said to him, uh, I don't understand. I, I can't exactly. I smarted off to him, and he started apologizing to me on the text. And I didn't mean it that way. What I meant was, if you don't call me and talk to me, I don't want to have nothing to do with you. Anybody can text, but I don't know your intent. So then when we talked on the phone, he's apologizing, and I'm laughing. Because I'm just jacking with you, you know. But he, he, he thought I, I was offensive toward him because he didn't understand what I was saying. And, and to me, I've often sent things joking and without seeing, again, who I am and what I am. And you don't know my personality. You could get offended. And people have. I've had people leave the church over something I've texted back to them because I didn't understand. My phone didn't have an autocorrect. This is the vacuum Many of us bring into reading the Gospels. We don't see the personality of Jesus. We, don't, we see a black and white, law-abiding, sent from heaven, redeemed the people, died on the cross, resurrected. But we don't see Jesus. And when you don't see Jesus, you miss out on a whole lot of stuff. When you lose his personality, you lose Jesus. You forget he's human. He's 100% human. Everybody loves to talk about his acts of humility, his servanthood, his faith, his compassion. What about his playfulness? What about his cunning? Well, what about his brilliance, his wit, his irreverence? Do you understand how irreverent Jesus was in that day? Even the Pharisees said, your, your disciples are eating on the Sabbath and, and picking corn. And he said, the, the Sabbath is for the Savior. They didn't pick it up. They didn't understand it. His, his humanity, his scandalous freedom. Everything about Jesus is so different from a lot of the churches that I see today. And here we find several places in the Bible where 
uh, Jesus, and I've got to go back on what I did yesterday, Tommy, because it's so much fun with it. But after his resurrection, okay, so he's been with the disciples three years. He's resurrected from the grave. After he resurrects from the grave, he shows up with Simon Peter, and he looks at Peter, and he says to him, Satan desires you that he is sift you as wheat. He wants to shake you. He wants to agitate you, man. But he said, I prayed for you that your faith fell not. The most powerful thing in your life is your faith. I appreciate your family, your finances, your friends, but they may, they may fail you, but your faith, you've got to keep your faith in God. So he looked at Peter, and he said, you've got to keep your faith. Then after the resurrection of Jesus, and he was gone for a little while, it, it, it hits me that it seemed like it was always around three days or 72 hours that there was an absence of him. And, it seemed, and, and again, in my mind, I'm thinking, how long does it take somebody to relapse? It only takes a couple of days for you just to give up. And so here in this moment, we see that, that Peter decided he's going back fishing. You've heard me say it for years, that a man with no future always reverts back to his past. He always heads back there. So here's Jesus on the shore with bread, baked bread, cooked on the fire, fish that he's already caught, and he knows the spot. You know, almost all fishermen, uh, they have their favorite spot. He go fishing with a with a with a professional. He said, "I show you where the bass are. Me, I show you where it's at. I know where it's at." So Jesus had the favorite spot because I believe this is the same spot where he first met the disciples and told them to cast that net on the right side of the boat, and the boat started to tip over. Remember all that? And they came to shore and he called them to be his disciples. It was an amazing moment. Jesus said to Peter, "From now on, you're going to catch men." But now what happened? He relapsed. He backslid. He he went back to his old ways. He's fishing naked. The Bible says they had to put his clothes on to go back to get in the water. All night, hanging out with the guys. He's just chilling out in the boat. My favorite picture is Jesus. This picture. It's hung in every church I've pastored. This picture. I love this picture. This picture reminds me of how he looks at me at times. He's laughing. The things I do, the stuff I, 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 I pull off, he's got to sit back and go, who puts on a car show in church? Now, look, you say, that's, that's common. 25 years ago, it wasn't. Uh, the way I dress in churches and the way I've preached in places and I've ran on pews. I threw bread in a church one time, teaching people cast your bread upon the water, and not many days it comes back to you, out of the book of Ecclesiastes. I was throwing bread, and while I was throwing bread out of a bucket, I looked over at a young man, I saw him, Connor, he, he started, he grabbed his lips, and uh, his cheeks filled up. I've seen that before, before I got saved. And I knew he was fixing up, Chuck. And I grabbed the bucket, and I dumped out all the bread, and I stuck it under his face, and I never took my eyes off what I was preaching to. I never looked at it, and I stuck it right under his mouth. When I did, he threw up in the bucket, and his mother grabbed him, and they escorted him out. I never missed a beat. That's anointing. <laughs> Even that, that's, that's just good preaching. And I know at that moment, Jesus had to look down at me and laugh. And then I think to myself, here he is on the side of the shore and the relapse of Peter and the rest of the disciples. By the way, when you get ready to backslide and go away, don't you want friends with you? So he pulls all of the disciples. They're, they're all out there, man. They're sitting with him. And uh, bring me down just a little bit because I'm a little hot in the monitors. And so he, he, he's sitting there, and, and as he's sitting on the side of the bank, the disciples out there fishing, and he yells at them. And this is my favorite part of the whole story. They fish all night long, haven't caught anything. And Jesus yells, caught any fish? Caught any fish? And as he's yelling at them, they, you, you've got to see the humor in it. Because the truth is they fished all night and caught nothing. And then they pull it to shore. And Jesus has them count the fish. Count them, 153 fish. That means you've got to take them out of this pile and put them into that pile. And they're counting the fish. And while they're counting, all I can see is him laughing at them. Amen. He's, he, it's just a funny moment in the Word of God. And I see it all through Scripture, him doing this. Now we find Jesus. Go, go to the Scripture, Nehemiah. 
Amen. And then I'll move on here. It says in Nehemiah, they turned a deaf ear and refused to remember the miracles you had done for them. They turned stubborn, got it into their heads to return to their Egyptian slavery. Speaking of the Egyptian, uh, the, the Israelites that came out of Egypt. Now, Egyptian slavery, let's just say that's your old ways. You got it in your head, you got stubborn, and you went back to your old ways. Don't look around, but a lot of us have done it. Amen. Now, and you, a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, incredibly patient, with tons of love, you didn't dump them. Let me tell you something about the love of God. He loves us so much. He had a prophet by the name of Hosea marry a girl named Gomer. I know you're thinking, who in the world would name their daughter Gomer? In the Hebrew, it would be Gomer, who was a prostitute. He had him marry her, a prostitute, and he showed it as a symbol that this girl is like the, the Israelites that I've loved, who keep backsliding, going back to her old lovers. She keeps going back. And even after Hosea married her, she had gone back to her old lovers. She left him. He was thankful she was finally gone. You'd think God's finally glad that we're gone because we just keep relapsing and falling back and not staying as in. What well, we come to church, but we're not as in love with him on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday as we act like we are on Sunday. Don't clap me down. So at this moment, during this relapse, she actually becomes useless. She's wore out from the men who have taken, who have done things to her, and they put her on a slavery block, and they're going to sell her as a slave. Then God speaks to Hosea, and he says to him, Take all the money that's necessary that you've got and go buy her back. In your mind, you're thinking, you've got to read the book of Hosea. He's thinking to himself, you want me to take my money and buy this prostitute who has left me, who was wore out back? And God said, yeah, that's my church. That's my church. That, that's, that's, my, that's the bride of Christ. I know they're messed up. I know they relapse. I know they fall back. I know they do their own thing. But I want you to know I love them. And there's, you can't go to a certain distance in your life that God don't love you. Come on. That he wouldn't redeem you and buy you back. Come on. That he gave his own son, amen, to redeem us back from the slavery and the mess that we've made. Come on, somebody yeah. give Jesus yeah. praise in this house. Yeah. Now we find, now we find, open your Bibles if you would, amen, Luke 24. Again, Jesus is resurrected. Two of the disciples are walking away from the scene. The, the tremendous, um, powerful appearances of Jesus. They even mention it. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. It's about seven miles from Jerusalem. So they've traveled seven miles. It's about from here to uh, about Huffman. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Kill the monitors, please. They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleophas, asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem? And do not know the things that have happened there in these days? Three days. It was 72 hours ago. You mean you don't know what happened three days ago? Now, in Jesus, what is he doing? He's walking along with them. He's just walking along with them. And, and they don't recognize him. They don't even, they, they're his disciples. They went to the little country church. Uh -huh. So Jesus says, what things? And they said, about Jesus of Nazareth. They replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word, indeed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and, and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. They crucified him. But we had hoped. Everybody said we had hoped. See, when you lose your hope, you lose your tomorrow. Come on. When you lose your hope, you, you lose whatever blessings are ahead for you. So that, that we hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day, 72 hours, that all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels 
and who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And Jesus said to them, well, tell me a little bit more. What else happened? Well, I'm, I'm, so, I'm curious, this guy, you mean he rose from the dead? And, and he, he did what? And, and, and he healed the sick and, and he touched the lame. And, and t- Tell me just a little bit more. And he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Genesis, Moses, Genesis, and all the prophets, he explained to them him. He began to tell them who he was. And he said in all the scriptures concerning himself, and as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going to go further. I'll see you guys later. I'm going over here. And then they said, no, no, don't go, don't go. Why don't you come and come home with us? Why don't you come hang out with us? It's, it's late in the evening. When I read that Jesus said, I think I'll go a little further. I think I'll, he reminded me when he was walking on the water, and the Bible says he would have passed by them. He was going to pass by. But what happened was, Peter said, is it you? Jesus said, yes. Then Peter, then he says, if it's really you, tell me to come. And Jesus said, come on. And he walked out on the water, and he began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus said, sure thing, and pulled him up. See, if you miss his personality, you miss Jesus. Because there's a lot more fun in him than you realize. Amen. There's a lot more joy in him than you realize. And some of us, we, got, we get saved and we start spitting icicles and we get all religious and self-righteous and we forget that God gave you your personality. And I try to remind myself, not everybody's personality is my personality. Amen. Some folk are a little more laid back and I try to give them some room. But I'm going to tell you, when God gets hold of you, it's like you start beaming forth. You start knowing that God is in you. So at this moment, they go to the house. And while they're at the house, Scripture says that they sat down and they approached the village. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread. He gave thanks for the food. You're not praying over your food. You're giving God thanks for the food. You're thanking God that you've got food to eat. Amen. So he gave thanks for the food. So he went in, stayed with them, took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. When their eyes were opened, recognized. Excuse me? That's when they recognized. And he disappeared from their sight, and they asked each other, not our hearts burning within us, when he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures. It was a stressful week. The one they pinned their hopes on had been crucified. He been nailed to a tree, died and put in a tomb. Three days, 72 hours had passed, and there was no hope to be seen. And then the word came from the angel that talked to Mary at the tomb. He's alive. Go tell the rest of the disciples. But even at that, they're walking away. There are days when miracles are not enough. You've had miracles in your life. You've seen God do amazing things financially, bless you relationally. Amen. He's looked after your family. And there and there are times that we can just take a couple of days and say, you know what? I've given up hope. I just can't do this anymore. I'm going to walk away. Don't need church no more. Don't don't need Jesus no more. You relapse, man, you dumb, stupid idiot. That was my pastor speaking through me, by the way. That's that's not me. That's something he'd say. Okay. So then I go back and I I see these guys walking and they're talking with Jesus. He began their hearts. Jesus even said the words, how slow of heart to believe. It's hard for you to believe. Your heart has become dull. It's beginning to callous. Amen. And so he began to open the scriptures. And I can't tell you how powerful it is for you to remember. Amen. The word of God has been spoken over you. The word is hermeneutics. It literally means to study a biblical interpretation. I would have loved to have been there with a, with a, a recorder to listen to Jesus talk about himself in Genesis and Exodus, and Leviticus, and start walking through Scripture and telling them who he was, that he was there in the very beginning. Amen. He was all through the Old Testament walking. He's the beginning. In the beginning was the 
word and the word was God. Amen. So he was there with them walking. But his manners opened up things. It's the way he did stuff. You ever seen somebody walk and you know whose kid they are? Oh, God, man, I know your daddy. You walk just like your daddy. You talk just like your daddy. Your manners are just like your daddy. Amen. So as Jesus, as they saw him, his manners changed him. His personality at the table shifted things in him. Again, he was going to go further along. They invited him in. So the premise here, come on up, Josiah. So the premise here for me to help you understand is this. You have to invite him into your life. Abide with him. It's not enough just to know Genesis and Exodus. Amen. You, gotta, you, you can hear the, even the word from him. But even at that, you've got to listen and invite him in. He said, if you knock on the door, I will answer. Amen. I want you to come on into my life. Behold, I stand there and I knock at the door. When I do, you need to answer that door. See, their hearts were dull. But what God wants is your heart dangerous. He wants you excited about God. Amen. He wants, he wants that thrill back in you. Amen. When they said, we're not our hearts burning. Some of you ain't had heart burning so long. You keep popping them spiritual roll aids to try to stop it. You need to let it burn, man. You need to let your heart burn for him. You cannot comprehend the scriptures until you begin to follow the Savior. You know, it's like putting together a puzzle without knowing the picture. If I hid the picture from you, you'd be struggling there with that big old puzzle. And by the way, sometimes putting together a puzzle upside down can be that. Amen, because you don't know what's gonna, what it's going to look like. That's sometimes life. There's Missing pieces, and I honestly believe that a lot of the missing pieces are in heaven when we get there. We won't see them till we get there. We don't know exactly how God's going to do this. But then he opened their minds. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled. So if I go on down into verse 44, he said, everything's got to be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Listen, my daughter right now, Jill, is in Turkey. She has run across Muslims and Hindus, and, and she's uh, been in Guatemala and dealt with uh, spiritual goofiness in, that, in certain areas. And listen, there is no God, no prophet that's ever said, everything has to be fulfilled about me. You need to know that I was, that scripture, when I go there, that's why I have such confidence in Jesus. I don't have confidence in Allah. I don't have confidence in a prophet named Muhammad. I don't have confidence in Buddha. But I got confidence in Jesus. Amen. He's walked with me. He's talked with me. Amen. He's fellowship with me. He's broke bread with me. I understand him. His personality beams in my mind when I read the word of God. Everything about him shouts at me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Ain't nobody getting to heaven except through me. Hmm. That's how I see it. So the Bible says that, that, that while I was still with you, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds. Prayer, Crosby High School, that God would open the minds. Ages there. Middle schools, and Channel View, and Dayton, Huffman, Baytown, the area that God would open their minds, that he would open the minds of the adults. Help us see him again. Amen. Can you see the lights going on? Can you see them going? Matter of fact, the Bible says when they recognized it was Jesus, he was gone. He's gone. He got, he got more things to accomplish. Amen. He took off from them. Their heart was slow. Then it was burning. Luke 24, 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets. Oh, hold on just a minute. Amen. Amen. All the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures. I can see him looking at them and saying, okay, listen, guys. In Genesis, the seed that will crush Satan's head, that's me. In, in, the, in Exodus, is this where you hit that thing? No, real hard. Thing. In Exodus, he said, I'm the Passover lamb. That's me. Paris. Just look up there on the overhead. We rehearsed this. And said, In Leviticus, boys, I'm the atoning sacrifice. A little bit more exclamation point. In Numbers, the bronze servant, when they said, look and live, hey, that's me at Golgotha. Bears. Why is this so hard? 
Well, go to the next slide. Show me where you hitting. Where you? There you go. Joshua, I was the warrior with a sword. Here to take over. Amen. In Judges, I'm your deliverer. Amen. In Ruth, your kinsman redeemer. Okay, now we're getting there. Next slide. In Samuel's Kings and the Chronicles, I'm the promised king. In Ezra and Nehemiah, I'm the restorer of the nation. In Esther, I'm your advocate. Amen. In Job, I'm your redeemer. In Psalms, I'm your all in all. In Proverbs, I'm your pattern and wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, I'm your goal. In Song of Solomon, I'm your beloved. In Isaiah, I'm the wonderful counselor, mind of God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Amen. Come on, keep rolling. There's got to be another. All the minor prophets, I am the coming king of kings and the Lord of lords. Their hearts, after 72 hours, slow to burning. Sorrow to hope, self-pity to all, worry to wonder, doubt to belief, from tugging their way to going his way. As a matter of fact, the scripture says that after that, they turned and ran seven miles back to Jerusalem. I can read it to you here. It says, when he had led them out in the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them, was taken up into heaven. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually in the temple, praising him. Changed their life. I'm here to tell you that you may know the Bible, but if you've not invited him, if you don't desire to abide with him, get to know him and his personality, what he's really like. This is the table turner, man. This is the guy that's not fair. This guy here said that there are people that I gave five talents to, two talents to, and one talent to. And if you're bothered by that, you don't understand a just God. This man right here made some claims that blew people away. He said, I was in the beginning. I saw Satan fall. I saw him kicked out of heaven. This guy laughed when Peter couldn't catch fish all night long. He sees your failures. But if you'll invite, abide with him and invite him in, he'll help you catch 153 fish. Amen. This one right here. See, you got to get to know your Jesus. There's none like him. Amen. He made them wake up. He caused a disturbance in their heart. Did not our heart burn within us? Yesterday, I took a moment. And I just stood and looked over 80 plus men. I don't know, 80 to 100. I don't know what you mean. But my heart just began to burn. And I realized, God, you're doing some great things in their lives. And if you touch these men, you're going to affect these communities. Amen. I thank you, Lord. There's a man here right now. He was here last year. I've done done his wife's funeral. He's back again. God, I thank you. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I wish I could spare your tears, disappointments. Scripture doesn't give us that. It tells us that life has some hardships to it. It's got pain with it. But everything pain, every hardship, this man overcame it. And even in overcoming it, his personality shined through. I'm asking God to light our fire again. To give our hearts a desire to fish for people. To not relapse like we've done before over and over. Amen. I, I just want you to lift your hands. You say, Father, I'm, I'm in the name of Jesus. Pray this with me, Lord Jesus. Strengthen my heart, my resolve. Give me the ability, the passion, the anointing to stay with it. Help me press through every addiction, every problem, 
that tries to take me away from you. I want to sit with you. I want to break bread with you. I want to abide with you. Lord, let me be fruitful in the days that remain in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise in here. That's my Jesus. Hey, you still love me? Natalia, love me. Sometimes the husband loves me, but the wives hate me. You know, been that way a long time. Amen. Hallelujah. Everybody feel good? Kind of like get rid of my heart. Yesterday, I didn't intend for this to go this way. As a matter of fact, I had no thought it would, but it did. Based off that young man's testimony, I thought to myself, how many times have we relapsed? Some of us just said, well, we just forgot to go to church. But no, you didn't. You just relapsed. You used an excuse, you were busy. The truth is, you just slipped away. Ain't nobody noticed you. Name on you. Don't notice you. They know you. Need a tither off an envelope that's in front of you. I thank you for your faithfulness to give it. Let me give you a quick heads, heads up. Your tithing is so important. But in this area, I tell you, you're offering too. Pastor David, air conditioner went back, went out in the back room. We've been here 10 years. AC went out. What's that AC going to cost us? $10,000. That's how much these units that are upstairs and down here cost. And we, we probably get a deal on it because the man that does it loves us. He loves God and my friend a long time he's a pastor. But on the flip side, I'm telling you, tithe and offering matters. We've got a lot to take care of here. Eventually we're going to get fans in the sanctuary. That'd be nice. Kind of keep you comfortable. You sleep when the preacher's there. Tuesday night. Everybody say Tuesday night. 7 o'clock. We should Hope to be in the, uh, hopefully, going to be in the fellowship hall. Works out, okay, and the weather's right. Get to AC, but we'll be here in this building somewhere. But I want you to show up Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, midweek, first week, midweek. Uh, my friend, Chris Renally, Pastor Chris Renally from Ecuador, will be with us, missionary. We're going to tag team together. I'd like for you to come and greet him, and we're going to honor and bless him. Amen. Appreciate our missionaries. We've been supporting Chris for 20 years. What he does there in Ecuador. You can't go to Ecuador. He can. So you're part of three armies. You're either part of the praying army, the bending army, praying for, or the sending army. If you don't want to go to Ecuador, be a part of the praying and the sending. Amen. Let's send them there. Take care of him. So Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. Pastor Dave, if you'd come. Amen. Give him a hand as he shows up there.